Thank you so much, Cal. As we've heard in our general sessions here from many of the presenters, they've suggested contacting your local officials through writing letters to the editors. A lot of the data that you're hearing here is something that you can take home with you and use in those letters to your editors to support available and abundant energy. Another uh, great fighter in this energy war is Roy Innes. And Roy Innes is the uh, the president of CARE, he's been the national chairman of CORE, excuse me, CARE is my organization, CORE is his. You can see the confusion. But CORE was founded in Chicago, which is the home of the Heartland Institute in 1942 at the University of Chicago. We are blessed today to have the civil rights icon, Roy Innes, who is the national chairman of CORE and has been for over 35 years. He has championed economic rights as the new civil rights movement. And his latest book, Energy Keepers, Energy Killers, which is in your packet that each one of you received that I was honored to have a part of, this book, Energy Keepers, Energy Killers, makes the case for environmental policies which do not punish the poor. It's a quick read. You can read it in the on the plane on your way home, and I hope each one of you will take advantage of that opportunity. And CORE has been in the forefront of the fight for affordable energy, nuclear energy production, malaria relief in Africa, economic justice for and, and economic justice for America's poor. So you can see what a great panel we have for you today. I would like to bring forth Roy Ennis, the chairman of the Congress of Racial Equality. But first, I think it's incumbent that we also recognize Niger Ennis, the national spokesperson for CORE, who has joined us. Niger, would you stand? Let's give Niger a round of applause. <laughs> Niger is the co chair of the current movement, the Alliance to Stop the War on the Poor, along with Jim Sims and others. I'd also like to recognize Paul Driesen, who is the author of Echo Imperialism. Paul, would you stand? Paul is a senior advisor to Roy Ennis. And also, we have the man that is the personal assistant to the chairman, Brian McLaughlin, would you stand as well? We want to thank you for assisting us in making sure that Mr. Ennis is here. You received a newsletter about CORE, some of the work we're doing in Chicago to keep the struggle going on energy affordability and the fight for environmental sanity as a public policy. The Heartland Institute is proud to offer the Energy Keepers, Energy Killers book on our website. Roy Ennis remains the leader of the consumer affordable energy movement. He's known internationally for his constant public service on behalf of America's least fortunate. Ladies and gentlemen, please join us in welcoming a living legend in the civil rights and human rights movement, Roy Ennis. see those of you who saw, saw me and heard me last year at this conference that I'm not in great shape. But I think uh, it's, it's, my problems were taken care of today by our new shining golden boy president who just released liberated stem cells, stem cells from the imprisonment by George Bush. Those of you who are here at the conference might not know this, but it was a big production. Cecil B. DeMille production at the White House today as he reversed the Bush policy in stem cells. And he promised, again, another promise, this one I hope he's right on, that uh, this action would make it possible to cure such ailments 
like uh, Parkinson's. I have a pre-Parkinson's syndrome problem, and I hope like Haley is right in that one. I wouldn't wait. <laughs> I'm glad that Ralph introduced Niger because I might have to call on him to give me a hand. He's well trained in all these points. You know, I became particularly concerned about this movement to reshuffle the economy of America And I was, I was concerned for a long time about the kinds of policies that we support as a country in Africa and other poor lands and in, 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 in the world. I was particularly, particularly concerned when I talked to a young lady from Chicago about energy. She was complaining, this is, this is the height of the energy catastrophe that took place last year. She was concerned about the cost for gasoline in the car she had rented here in New York. And I, I said to her, you know, we really don't have to pay this kind of price if we had more affordable gasoline, more affordable energy available to us. And I mentioned Anwar, and she railed, railed against the thought of drilling in Anwar, a drilling on the Florida coast and the California pristine coast, coastline. And I jumped upon the Anwar reaction and I said to her, have you been to Anwar? And she said, no. Do you plan to go to Anwar? <laughs> no. She's from Chicago. She has all the snow she needs in Chicago. <laughs> but she was outraged at the thought of even considering. I didn't ask her because she spelled Anwar because I know she probably couldn't, although she's a very intelligent, attractive young lady. I became even more concerned when I went to Africa to do a, a documentary on malaria. You know, the poor African nations are suffering this scourge of ma malaria infestation caused by the Anopheles mosquito. And I, while in the major hospital in Uganda, a young lady had traveled across most of the country with her baby who was in the coma and, has, and had been in comas before because of malaria. And I said to, uh, to her, I said, you know, we can avoid this, this cycle that this child has gone through. With, 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 comas from malaria, if we were able to spray your area. Now, her area happens to be adjacent to the Congo, right. a very, very undeveloped part of the Congo. And this young lady said to me, spraying with DDT cannot be done because it is no good for the environment. Now, her doctor is here, the baby in the coma is next to the doctor, and she's next to the baby. And her priority at that moment in this discussion was the environment, the earth. And I said, how is it possible that this young lady in Central Africa coming from a very remote part of her own country, next to the Congo, sees DDT as the greater problem 
as injuring, allegedly injuring the, the, the earth, the environment, she used the word, as against her baby not having to go through a cycle of comas caused by malaria infestation. And I start thinking as I travel back to the United States, I remember my conversation with a lady from Chicago, from South Chicago. Not the most affluent part, she is more affluent than the average person in South Chicago. But she too, while complaining about a problem, was diverted from a solution because of the heavy propaganda, the heavy conspiracy that propagandizes our country and the world, not just our country, about the environment, about the earth, uh, I am convinced that these two people, this young lady from Chicago and the young lady with the baby in Uganda, are decent people. They are relatively, in, well, they are very trained, very intelligent. They want to do the right thing. And I realize that the problem we have is that we have a lot of people in search of the right thing to do but who are subject, captive of the corruption of an ideology, a corrupting ideology. The average person hears these days about green, green jobs. Without the defining what a green job is, it gets over to them as something good. The environment, not, 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 not conservation now, the environment is a good thing to them. They want to do the right thing. The conspirators, the radical environmentalists, certain industrialists, the tea boom pickings and such, who made his money in oil, but now is pursuing these alternate sources of, of energy and is part of that conspiracy against decency, domestically and internationally. The people that Carol talked about, well-meaning people, wanting to do the right thing. We would train, we as a movement, the civil rights movement, train America and train the world into how to protest, how to reach into people's morality, how to seize the moral high ground. And that was what happened here with the question of global warming. A term was sanctified to, be, to, to become a religion. Greenness becomes a religion. Uh, all of the language undefined, unquestioned, and of course with tremendous support from the media establishment. So much so that a girl from South Central Chicago, South Chicago, and then a young lady from Central Africa used the same kind of language, the same script. Now, these are not people who are trying to do the wrong, the wrong thing. They don't have a, they're not part of the conspiracy, but they are the subjects, the victims of that conspiracy. It is so clear and so obvious that these experimental pursuit of alternative energy is gonna have a tremendous effect on poor people. You wonder how a guy could run for the presidency of the United States on a platform that's supposed to be rescuing the poor and doing all these things for the poor and the most, one of the most important jobs 
that the poor need done for them is to make energy, the most basic of commodity, more available, dependable, predictable in price for them. But they're able to get away with this because they have put themselves in a moral high ground and, and a moral plane. And we, to a certain extent, have bought into that. We saw where, uh, in the presidential election last year, we see where John McCain was paralyzed, was unable to fight the Barack campaign. You couldn't call Barack by his name. You couldn't call him Hussein, which is what he used for the inauguration. But during the campaign, you couldn't call him that. They had so bamboozled, they had so corrupt what is considered decent that that was not permitted. That the most outrageous behaviors and associations had to be hidden, be ignored. I am here today first to, to thank the Heartland Institute for allowing me again to come back and address you and to call on you for help in this new civil rights battle. A battle to, to, to protect poor people, not just black people, but poor people, people of moderate income. The protection is not gonna come from Barack Obama. He's gonna promise protection. Protection is gonna come from us and our ability to challenge this new religion of global warming, of anti-carbon products, of ignoring our great resource, resource base of coal and gasoline and uh, gas. That's a major fight that this country needs. This is, it, it, this is the new civil rights battle because without available and dependable, predictable energy sources, we cannot enjoy this great economy of ours. First of all, this economy is not going to exist much longer in the way it's, dr it's drifted. Two years ago from now, None of you could predict that the government would be giving out the kind of money they are giving out to big business. We are so, we are so bulldozed by the propaganda and its reinforcement by the media establishment that we are unable to fight and expose this to ordinary people. That is the battleground that we must come together on. We have to let our little differences go by us and recognize that our economy, our country is in danger, not from Soviet military power, but from Soviet type thinking. I will ask you in closing to think of the parallel to the start of the 20th century, how that alliance was able to, uh, uh, the, the Bolshevik and other socialist types, who weren't Bolsheviks, who weren't communists, but they were socialists, how they were conned into creating the conditions, the crisis in Russia that led to the Bolshevik revolution and for, for communism to threaten the world for most of the 20th century. I will suggest to you that we here at the start of the 21st century are in exactly the same position. Let us not make the same mistake made by Alexander Kerensky and these other dupes that were tricked by Lenin and the Bolsheviks into handing the country over to them. Thank you.